Hey, welcome back. Today we're talking about the second condition for equilibrium, or rotational equilibrium, for physics and AP physics classes. So I want to start with a question. Let's imagine this is a table, and two people are pushing on the table. Is the table in equilibrium? Now before you answer, consider these two forces are equal and opposite, and yes, they are offsets, but basically they are still equal and opposite forces. So what do you think? Well, you would say that yeah, the forces are equal and opposite. So from a previous definition of equilibrium, I guess you could say that, yeah, the table's in equilibrium. If we just consider forces, then yes. And this is going to demonstrate that we need to update our definition of equilibrium. So let's answer the second question. Will the table rotate? And if so, what causes the rotation? All right, well, at this stage of the unit of rotation, hopefully you're aware that, yes, this table is going to rotate. This force will cause it to rotate clockwise. This one will also cause it to rotate clockwise because those two forces are going to provide a torque. So they are going to provide a torque. So we need to update our definition of what we mean by equilibrium to also include torque because clearly this thing could accelerate with these two forces being applied in the clockwise direction. So how do we update our definition for equilibrium? Well, we're going to need to incorporate torque. And so we're going to say now equilibrium, or you could say mechanical equilibrium, means zero net force and zero net torque on an object. So this object is actually not in equilibrium. It will experience an acceleration from these forces, even though there's no net force because those forces are equal and opposite to each other, there is going to be a net torque because of where they are placed, and that will cause an angular acceleration. Let's think about how to apply this in a problem. So here we have a zombie woman on a plank. Why a zombie woman? Well, that's the artwork I could find that was free. So a zombie woman on a plank and she's got a certain amount of weight and she has her center of mass placed at 1.5 meters from this pivot point. So this is a pivot point right here and then you have the length of the beam here and you have a tension right here. There's also a force we're going to call R from the pivot point itself directed up and to the right. We don't know much about it. We don't know the angle here. We do know the length of the beam right here, 5.55 meters. And so the question is, what is going to be the force of tension in this cable right here? And what is the R force that we have over here? So if we would just use our normal definition of equilibrium, this would be a problem, trying to solve this problem here. Yes, she's not moving. We're going to assume she's not moving. It's not rotating at all. And it would be very, very difficult to solve. But using the second condition of equilibrium, it's going to be a lot easier. It'll still be a challenge, but it's definitely doable. All right, so let's see how to do this. First of all, we can use a strategy that I call the sum of the torque strategy, which is the rotational version of the sum of the forces strategy. So the first line for the sum of the torques is the sum of the torques, and then we literally just add up all of the torques. And so you've got the torque from tension in the Y, that's providing a torque, right? And the tension from the beam, and the tension from the zombie right here, how about the tension from the R right here? Do we have a tension here? And the answer is no. There is a force that we're describing as R right here, but because it's at the pivot point, which is shown by this dark circle, then there is no torque involved. Think about it this way. If you applied a force on a door hinge, would you be able to rotate the door? And the answer is no, not really, because you would not be providing any torque. All right, and the second line for the sum of the torque strategy is to say, sum of the torques is equal to the moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And then what do you think we do next? Next, we're going to take these, set them equal to each other, and see what happens. Two of them we need to make negative, and one we need to make positive. And that's because if we have a rotation that would be caused by a torque, that would be counterclockwise. That's going to be treated as positive, like this tension right here, this force due to tension. And the other two forces are going to cause a clockwise rotation, and so they would be considered to be negative torques. All right, so you add them together, and let's think about this. We can separate out the torque due to tension and the Y over here. This is the torque from the beam and the torque from the zombie. So one way to think about this is that torque from the tension of the Y is what's supporting the torque that's provided by the beam and the zombie. All right, so we can break this down a little more and think about what torque means. 
And so torque is going to be this perpendicular force times an R vector. And you can change the order a little bit as long as you're dealing with correct forces here. And so this is the torque in the Y from the tension. And that's going to be times the entire length of the beam. This is going to be the force due to gravity of the beam itself. So we're going to assume this is a uniform beam. So the center mass of the beam is going to be right in the middle. So we take that L, that length of 5.55. We divide it by 2, and that's where the force is going to be considered to be applied. And then we also need to be careful about where the force from the zombie is applied, and that's going to be at 1.50 meters. All right, so then we would continue with the problem, and we would say, let's solve for what we can solve for and figure out what we need. We still need the force of tension and the Y. So you do the math, and you turn out with this number right here for the force due to tension and the Y. Now, if you think about what that means, you can take that force tension in the Y and put it into a triangle along with force tension, and you know what the angle is that's involved. So we can take that and do some simple work here to be able to solve for what the tension in the Y is. And you do the math, and you turn up with this value right here, 416 newtons. All right, so let's go back to our vector of force tension. And so we had worked with force tension, solve for force tension in the Y. We will need to think about what force tension the x is as well. And then we need to build on that and think about how are we going to get any of the information about r here. The components for r and the angle, we essentially know nothing about r so far. So one way we can approach this is just now we can go ahead and use the sum of the forces in the x because now we know more about this information right here. So we do the sum of the forces in the x and literally add up the forces in the x. Notice that this will be a positive value. This is going to be a negative value here. And the second line of the sum of the forces strategy is to say the sum of the forces in the x is equal to mass times acceleration in the x. We can set these equal to each other. This system is not accelerating in the x at all, and so we can make that a zero. And that whole term drops out, so we set them equal to zero, and we find that the r value in the x is equal in magnitude to the ft value in the x. Then we can go back and say, well, we know what ft in the x is. We can relate that to ft times the cosine of 55.5. And so now we can solve for r in the x. So this is the answer for that. So we're one step closer to solving for our problem. We still need r in the y. So let's do the sum of the forces strategy in the y. Here we've got four forces in the y-axis. You've got an r in the y, ft in the y, force of gravity for the beam, and force of gravity for the zombie. And we know that there's no acceleration here. So the second line of the sum of the forces strategy is ma in the y, but that's going to be zero, so we can set these equal to each other, and what happens is you end up with this. Let's think about what we know and what we don't know. Really the only unknown at this point is going to be r in the y, so we can go ahead and start to isolate for that, plug in our numbers, and we've solved for r in the y. Now, we know r in the y, and we know r in the x. How would we go about solving for the hypotenuse of a right triangle when we know the two legs? easy, right? You're going to use the Pythagorean theorem, and so you can do that, and I've done that here, and you end up with this answer. One more thing I forgot to do, but that would be easy to do, is just to solve for this angle. I'll put a link up for a screencast on how to solve for an angle when you know two legs of a triangle. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any comments, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.